Uh, good morning, sir. Can you see and hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, thank you very much. May I call Philip Baldman, please? I'd like to start of course. Of this report <coughs> to me. I do solemnly. I do solemnly. Sincerely and truly. Sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Waldman. As you know, my name is Jason Beer, and I ask questions on behalf of the inquiry. Can you give us your full name, please? Uh, Philip Kevin Baldman. Uh, thank you very much for coming to give evidence to the inquiry today and for the provision of two witness statements assisting us in our um, investigation. Those two witness statements should be in the uh, hard copy bundle in front of you. Can we look at the first of them, please, which is dated the 4th of August um, uh, 2022? and which, excluding the exhibits to it, should be 12 pages in length. For the transcript, the URL is, is WITN 04790100. If you go to the 12th page of the witness statement, uh, can you see a signature? It is. Is that your signature? It is. And subject to the corrections and additions that you make in the second witness statement, are the contents of that first witness statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? They are. Thank you. Can we go to the second witness statement, please? That's dated the 8th of November, 2022, and is two pages in length. For the transcript, the URN is WITN 04790200. Uh, is the signature on the second page of that witness statement true? It is. Uh, sorry, is that, that your signature? It is, yes. And are the contents of that witness statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? They are. Thank you. A copy of each of those witness statements will be uploaded to the inquiry's website and thereby be publicly available. So I'm not going to ask you questions about um, every passage within them. Uh, instead, just ask you selected questions. Do you understand? I do. Thank you. Uh, I'm only going to ask you questions that are relevant to phase three of the inquiry, in particular relating to the impact programme, and not ask questions that may be relevant to later phases in the inquiry, about which you may be able to give evidence, in particular phase seven of the inquiry. Okay. Uh, can we start, please, with your background and experience? Um, I think you joined um, ICL PLC in November 1989, is that right? I did, um, in the manufacturing division, uh, division and um, I was working there uh, for um, developing systems to support um, the planning and management of manufacturing and logistics functions. And you're still employed by Fujitsu um, at this present time? I am, yes. And so you've been employed by Fujitsu and its relevant predecessor companies or company for it. about 33 years or so? Indeed. You are presently the service architect for the post office account, is that right? That's right, yes. And just tell us briefly, what does the service architect role involve? It involves um, defining the changes of, of services as post office cha business changes, and they, um, more recently, I've been in that role since 2014, and that um, since then, post office have been um, changing the services, bringing on new suppliers to... to um, um, their services from other suppliers other than Fujitsu at various times. Now, I want to ask you some questions about your background and experience, sure. because uh, neither of those matters are dealt with in uh, either of your witness statements. Firstly, do you have any professional qualifications that are relevant to the issues that we're considering, for example, um, in computing or information technology? I have an MBA from Warwick University, um, and so... Whilst back at, at um, ICL Manufacturing, um, the, the field of business process modelling and analysis and business process management support systems was relatively new then, and I got some training in that there and we had opportunities to, um, to practice that in some internal projects within ICL. In 1995, I joined a newly formed consultancy practice um, in ICL that uh, was offering business process modelling, analysis, business process redesign um, services to ICL's external clients. And so by the time I was doing work um, on the impact project in 2002, um, I'd had 
seven years experience um, of delivering business process model and analysis consultancy. I'm going to come to on to experience a in, a, in, in a moment. I'm just asking about qualifications at the moment. Oh, okay, sorry. Have you got any qualifications in no. um, anything relating to information technology or computing? No. Um, um, when, an when did you? Mathematics degree. Sorry. I have an engineering mathematics degree. Right. And um, when did you take your MBA? Um, 2011, I finished that. Did you play any part in the procurement, design, build, testing, or rollout of the Horizon system between, say, 1996 and 2000? Not at all. When did you first become involved in the Horizon uh, system? Um, uh, 2002, uh, as part of the end-to-end -end project uh, program that post office were running. Um, that's um, the first date that's mentioned in your witness statement. Um, autumn 2002, you mentioned in paragraph 9. Uh, is that when you first became involved in the Horizon system, autumn that's 2002? Right. Uh, I'd been contacted by post office accounts within ICL at the time. Um, post office were intending running this end-to-end um, -end program and wanted to take a, a holistic um, process review approach to what they were doing. Between 1995 and autumn 2002, um, what jobs were you doing within ICL or Fujitsu? So I was, like I say, I was working in ICL manufacturing, <laughs> other internal roles within, within um, ICL generally reviewing um, processes and defining new processes and starting to work with external clients from, um, sorry, 295, did you ask? No, from 95. Oh, from 95. When from, Horizon. From 95. Hold, so hold on, hold on. Um, it's better that we don't talk over each okay, other. Okay, sorry. Okay. Um, it makes it difficult for the transcriber to transcribe, mm -hmm. and it makes it difficult for people listening online to hear. So between 1995, which is the birth of Horizon, and autumn 2002, when you first became involved in Horizon, I'm asking what jobs you did. So I, I was working as a business process consultant, offering services to um, ICL clients in a, a you know, set, of, set of industries, um, retail, financial services, manufacturing, transport, and local and central government, a variety of different clients. Thank you. In that period, what knowledge, if any, did you have of the Horizon system? None, other than other than ICL internal announcements about um, you know, winning business and putting things together of, of ICL pathway. Did you know anything in terms of any issues or problems with the robustness of the operation of the Horizon system no, in that period before you uh, took up a role in the autumn of 2002? I was, work I was working with other clients at that time. When you became involved in the impact program, in um, or what became known as the impact program, Indeed, yes. um, in autumn of 2002, I think you were a business process consultant. That's right, yeah. Uh, what is a business process consultant? So I was, um, uh, like I say, post office wanted to do a holistic review of their business processes and look at the, the, um, the ways that their system, internal systems could support those better. Um, so there was a, a group of, of business analysts from post office, and I was supporting them in doing business process modeling, capturing information about the way, the way their business processes worked, and um, helping them understand them, think about ways that things could be done differently. Uh, to whom did you report in Fujitsu? In Fujitsu, it would have been the chief architect, Tony Drahota, and later uh, Bob Gurney, who was working for Tony. Uh, what was the name of the team, if you were in a team of which you were a part? It was, um, it was RASD, and, and the, the, what those letters stand for is somewhere in my witness statement. But I Requirement can't of architecture, <laughs> systems, you. design. That's right. And who was the leader of the RSAD team? Uh, Tony Drahota. How many people were within the RSAD team? I think it would have been around about 10. Uh, did you manage the team? No. 
who managed the team? Tony Drolter. Where did you sit in terms of the team hierarchy? Um, probably fairly low down. And um, what were the jobs of the other people within the team? Um, some requirements analysts, some <coughs> architects. Um, yeah, mostly <laughs> requirements analysts and architects. Did you have an opposite number in the post office? Um, a, a number, um, the, in particular, um, Dave Parnell and Karen Hilston, um, Julie Pope and Karen White at various times. But, but uh, initially, um, Dave Parnell and Karen Hilston were the main contacts. Thank you. I want to turn to the feasibility study Indeed. and Fujitsu's in, uh, input into it. You tell us in paragraph 10 of your witness statement, that's on page three, that um, what began um, or became to be known as the impact program was initially known as the end-to-end re-architecting program. Is that right? That's right, yes. Uh, that it included a series of workshops and analyses to produce a feasibility study document. Is that right? That's right, yes. And that that document was called um, end-to-end re-architecture feasibility study <coughs> business requirements. That's Is that right? And that that document is dated the 21st of February 2003. I just want to chase down that document to make sure that we're talking about the same one. Um, the document, um, I think, is FUJ3098198. That will come up on the screen for you, Mr. Portman. Yes. Now, you'll see that this document um, has the same title as the document that you mentioned in your witness statement, um, sure. end-to-end re-architecture, feasibility study, business requirements. That's right. Um, you'll see that it's, um, the date on it is um, two years out in the top right-hand. That, that, that's, that's a typo. I just want to check that. Um, it's dated the 21st of February 2001. Mm -hmm. If we go to page two of the document, Thank you. I think under the document history, we can see that it's dated um, as version 0 0.1, the 21st of February 2003. That's right. And uh, if we look at the foot of the page, we can see that there's a, a post office copyright of 2003. And so um, th the date of this document we should take to be the 21st of February 2003, is that right? Yes. And this is a post office document, is that right? That's a post office document. It's uh, signed off by Sue Hardin, I believe, yes. Thank you. Um, it's right, is it not, that Fujitsu jointly with the post office, however, that document can come down, uh, identified the post office requirements for this programme? Well, yes, we were working as a, as a joint team. Can we look in that connection uh, at FUJ 3098169? Uh, we can see the title of the document is Fujitsu Services Input to Feasibility Study. Uh, for end-to-end re-architecting of post office systems, and it's dated um, the 24th of March 2003, so about a month after the document that we have um, just looked at. Is that right? That's right. And you tell us in uh, your witness statement that you had um, input, as you describe it, into an earlier version of this document. Is that right? right. So, so the um, the end-to-end -end feasibility um, document effectively was the the post office's requirements specification. This was a, a proposal made by Fujitsu of, of what could be done to try and um, address some of those requirements. And you had input into this document, the one we're looking right. at on the screen? But, mo but mostly the, the, the architects, architecting the, the system, were the key writers of that document. 
So I miss what you said. You're dropping your voice very slightly at the end so of each answer. The, um, the architects were, were, had editorial control of, of this document. I was inputting in terms of requirements. So you did have input into this Indeed, document? Yes. Thank you. Um, you would have seen and approved the document before it went to the post office, presumably? Um, I'd have reviewed it, yes. I don't think I, I had approval <laughs> authority, but uh, yes, I'd have, I'd, I'd have given my input. If there was anything in it that you thought was wrong or shouldn't be said, yes. you would have said so? I would. Thank you. And can we just look at page six um, of the document, please? And look under the heading um, Management Summary. And I'm going to take this document quite slowly because this is the first time we've really looked at uh, what became the impact programme and the reasons for it. Can we read this um, together just to get an outline of the programme? Um, uh, Fujitsu here say, uh, post office is experiencing a major change in its operating and commercial environment. It must transform its cost base, processes and behaviours to meet the challenge. Um, embracing the joint IS landscape. Um, what does IS mean? Um, information sy systems, I believe. Um, I think... There'd been a, um, a, some sort of contract change before I joined Post Office Account, and um, the, this, um, this process of joint working had been agreed as part of that, I believe. Okay. So embracing the joint information system landscape arrangements from the Extended Horizon Agreement, Fujitsu Services has been working with the Post Office, analysing where cost benefits could be realised through re-architecting the current state of post office systems and through adoption of new business processes. This document sets out a blueprint for a program of migration to a coherent system set which will deliver the target process improvements as quickly as possible and at least risk. It takes account of where natural process boundaries exist to define the logical demarcation lines between Fujitsu services and the PRISM consortium. Um, that's the first we've heard of the PRISM Consortium. Who or what was the PRISM Consortium? As I understood it, um, I, before I'd um, joined the Post Office account and been involved in any of this um, programme, Post Office's internal um, IT systems department had been outsourced to a, a consortium of, of companies um, CSC and Zansa were the two that I knew of. I think, it, I think there were others involved, um, and they were known as PRISM Consortium or sometimes PRISM Alliance in various documents. Um, so this is um, the, the key supplier to, of post offices' other systems. The, you know, all, all, the, all the systems um, involved in this review other than Horizon. It continues, um, it contains proposals to deal with the taking of contractual responsibility for delivery and operations, but also considers how work might be shared in a controlled fashion among the various parties. Fujitsu Services is pleased to submit this document, developed as an input to the post office end-to-end -end feasibility study, and looks forward to continued joint working in the development of effective systems to support the post office business. All pricing and time scales assume this approach. The paper sets out Fujitsu Services' approach to the system's re-architecture, explains the design aims, outlines indicative pricing, and offers a proposed implementation plan. And then if we go to 1.1, please, underneath. Uh, post office requirements. Uh, the analysis of the requirements has been conducted as a joint activity with post office IT directorate, business systems, and critically, post office business departments. Uh, business representatives contributed significantly through workshops and meetings with analysts and through validation and verification of findings. And so um, this part of this paragraph is um, uh, telling us that the um, requirements of the post office were not in a perhaps a more traditional way set out by the post office. They were jointly identified uh, uh, between um, and in conjunction with each other, um, the post office and Fujitsu, is that right? Um, 
Fujitsu were in the room. I don't think any of the, the, the set of people a parties in that in that list includes Fujitsu, does it? Are they post office yeah. IT directorate? That's business systems. That's post office. Post office business departments. Business representatives. None of those parties are Fujitsu. Yes, and yes, Fujitsu were in the room. And so, what were the Fujitsu in, doing in terms of understanding requirements? But we weren't telling them what their requirements were. That wouldn't make sense anyway. And so what, you were in the room and what, writing stuff down, li listening yes. si silently. And obviously not silently, but you know, yes, yes, asking questions, clarification questions, you know, discussing the requirements that, that would be in and trying to ask questions to elaborate requirements. OK, so we, if I put it this way, Fujitsu were helping Post Office to identify its business requirements. Indeed. Is that right? Yeah. Is that a fair way of describing it? I believe so, yes. And that was done, as um, it is said here, through meetings between Post Office and Fujitsu and uh, workshops. And I think you were present at some of those. Is that and, right? And facilitated some of them. Um, and they're not through <laughs> between Fujitsu and Post Office, but between Post Office, those sets of Post Office representatives. Um, at times, I would have been the only Fujitsu representative in the room, and there would have been 13, 14 people, post office representatives. Um, at other times, um, colleagues, um, including um, Gareth Jenkins, who was the lead architect for this program, and ha who had a, a great deal of knowledge about um, Horizon, and um, Luxmi Solvaraja, who was um, a, a consultant from ICL's um, SAP practice, uh, was in the room. Um, clarifying requirements in terms of you know, understanding what was it that post office were trying to achieve. Um, there was, it was identified pretty early on that post office were likely to need to replace their, their core financial systems. And they had already invested heavily in SAP for their um, cash stock management systems. Tell, so, tell the chairman what SAP is, please. Um, it's, it's a... Um, a, a large scale, large scale um, system for managing accounts and businesses generally, and has a number of um, areas of functionality. The um, paragraph um, continues. So, sorry, I should just ask you about the workshops and meetings. Um, who from? post office attended these workshops and meetings? Um, so, it, as it says, post office business departments. So the, the workshops tended to be um, focused around particular areas of business process. So if it was um, around the settlement, client settlement, then it might be around with people from um, post office accounts and their, their, um, their, their client managers. Um, with, for branch processes, there were some people from um, Retail Line. There were, I think there might have been some representation, of example postmasters, but I don't think there were ever any actual po postmasters. Um, what, what do you they, mean there might have been some repre representation so, example postmasters? Sorry, people who had been postmasters before who were then working in the Retail Line, I believe. Did anyone suggest? Um, they, they, I'm sorry, I spoke over you. Sorry, I was going to say um, the two business analysts, Dave Parnell and Karen Hillsden, that were involved in these particular workshops, had both worked in in post office business, had, had um, risen through the ranks to come and join head office in in Chesterfield. They were both Chesterfield based. Um, Is there anyone in the room that was actually using Horizon um, in a post office? I don't believe so. Why was that? Um, post office were identifying who should be representing the various interests of the requirements. Did anyone suggest bringing sub postmasters into the workshops? I, I did, and at that, um, when planning workshops, as a you know, um, trying to facilitate workshops, you'd talk about who should be involved and what the various communities were going to be, and um, and the answers that I got were that you know, Dave Parnell, Karen. Hillsden were 
had used Horizon before regularly, you know, because um, lots of people in post office then also would go off and work as um, either relief managers on a, on a basis or go and work in, in branches during um, peak times at, at Christmas. Um, I seem to remember in that in that time, 2002, we were, we were back in a time when there were such things as strikes, and they went and gave did relief work in, in post offices in uh, during strikes as well. So there were there were people who occasionally used the, the system, but there weren't regular users. And you suggested bringing some regular users in, uh, asking about representation at least. It, it's it's very difficult when you've got. Um, I think so. I, I think I've seen some um, some of the um, inquiry uh, witness sessions from er people talking about earlier in the thing. Uh, initially, there were about nineteen and a half thousand branches. At this time, I think there were around seventeen and a half thousand. Um, so, but you're still talking about you know thirty odd thousand users, and so getting full representation of systems is always difficult. Um, but what was yeah. the response to you suggesting that some oh. ac actual real post, post office had, hold, hold had on, hold on. Sorry. I haven't quite finished yet. What was the response by the post office to your suggestion that some actual real sub postmasters who right. used Horizon on a day to day basis come into the workshops? That they felt that they had sufficient representation. Were help desk staff amongst those who were present in the workshops? I don't recall any. Did anyone suggest that they, help desk staff should be present in the workshops? Um, I think the discussions were mostly around retail line. T t is that a, a no that, that that wasn't suggested? That people oh, who were dealing on a day-to-day -day basis with the problems that so, some postmasters felt? Um, so when you say help desk staff, yes. do you mean post office help desk staff at MBSC or do you mean Fujitsu help desk staff at... A any or all of the above? I, well, because retail line, and as I understood it from post office um, explaining, retail line and MBSC worked closely together. And so issues around use of, of Horizon would mostly, it, unless, there was a, unless there was a fault with the system, issues would mostly be taken up with the use of the system, they'd be taken up by NBSC. Can we look at the foot of the page? Um, Post Office and Fujitsu Services have identified the following as the key areas of potential um, savings and operational improvements. And we'll see that there are six areas that are um, set out where it is said that money can be saved. There's a bullet point, a, a square um, box for each of them, and then the saving or the range of savings um, is set out in a circular bullet point um, underneath. So if we can just look at the um, second bullet point, which is in fact on the next page. Thank you. Under accounting, the second of the six bullet points, it is said that um, Fujitsu and the post office had jointly identified a, a £9 million uh, annual saving in accounting uh, as a result of, amongst other things, a decrease in debt, um, uh, lower write-offs. Can you explain what that means, please? Lower write-offs. Um, so, I think to, to to explain that you need to understand the the, the these um, back-end systems that, that are being talked about in the last sub-bullet there, CBDB. Um, CBDB was and and Class were the two financial systems that Post Office ran at that time. Had been developed in-house by Post Office. Optip was the system acting as the interface between um, Horizon and those back-end accounting systems. Um, at this state, well, so the CBDB set of, of, of systems, as I understood it, um, had been developed in-house 
for um, post office. They were um, batch system based, overnight batch runs, lots of inputs put in during the day and, and calculations done overnight and were um, built around um, weekly processes. And in some respects, they were legacy systems that hadn't been able to be updated sufficiently when Horizon started feeding daily information into them, such that there were um, much of that debt. Um, this is a, a summary of the of the requirements and the cost savings identified in the in the end-to-end -end feasibility document. Um, across there, there, it talks about um, the issues around settlement, client settlement. By this stage, of course, those nightly feeds were also going off to clients. So um, large utility companies would be getting um, nightly feeds of, of sit into their systems to say this customer has paid their gas bill this much of, of their gas bill and that would go into the, their account systems and be managed in the in the accounts against those those people's accounts um, but that meant that those organizations utility companies that had invested in um, systems that could cope with um, daily feeds, nightly feeds, um, were coming to post office quicker than their processors were working out what they owed those utility companies. And in the times of those, those timing differences with clients invoicing and post office having the data to be able to verify that that was the correct amount, those amounts were held as debt. And so, um, there was those sorts of debt. That's the majority, I believe, as we'll discuss later, there was some in terms of um, postmaster debt. Did this bullet point intend to address uh, all sub postmaster the, debt? All of the above, yeah, all of those. And tell us um, in brief terms how it, um, uh, this bullet point relates to um, a saving by decreasing the amount of written off sub postmaster debt? Um, because similarly, post offices central systems were based on a weekly cycle. And, um, and that caused a large amount of, of, of the timing issues that just like with, with clients. Um, can I give a, an example? And this is sort of an end to end um, um, life cycle of, a, of a, a, a debt that isn't a debt. In, in, the, um, in the feasibility study document, it refers to a, um, how the aim is to reduce 95% of, of debt, but it then says, the next bullet is, says there, that only 10% of debt is real debt. And that 90% of debt that isn't real debt, is not real debt, is these timing mismatches. Um, so if I give an example, I apologize, it's a very low value example, but um, back, back then, when a, when a, a clerk was um, selling a stamp, the um, majority of stamps were sold from large books and torn perforated sheets of stamps, and a stamp would be torn from the, from the sheet. If that's, if that, when performing that transaction in the post office, a, a clerk had accidentally ripped the post, the sta postage stamp into two, that postage stamp couldn't be sold. And so, but that created a discrepancy because at that point the stock had been become obsolete, but the stock was held in the post office, post, some postmaster's accounts as, let's say it's a 10p stamp. So what, the process, as I understood it, as it explained to me, was that um, post, the sub-postmaster would take that, the two halves of that stamp and stick it on a form because there was a form especially for um, reporting obsolete and, or destroyed stock. Ru ruined stock, stock. Ruined stock, indeed. And the ruined stock, they'd stick that stamp on there and account for the 10p of, of discrepancy by passing 10p into their suspense account 
obviously it, it's more than 10p. Over the course of the week, there'd be multiple stamps, but let's follow the end to end. Um, that suspense account would get added as, as a 10p uh, discrepancy into the, into the suspense. The form would get sent off. Um, apparently, it was quite common for forms, be, you know, post, so postmasters would wait until um, multiple stamps had been stuck on and the form might sit in the post, post office for weeks, but let's follow the rules that, that they, that week they send that form off with their um, cash account form. Um, during that week, post office would then verify that that 10p was destroyed stock and they could recredit the or, or t write off that stock. And so post office would send an error notice, a paper error notice, back to the sub postmaster, the, the branch. That might arrive within the week. It might arrive the following week after the, the next cash account. All the time that this, uh, eventually that error notice allowed the sub postmaster to bring the amount out of suspense and to write that 10p off. But all the time that that 10p was in suspense, that was Cluster's debt for, um, for Post Office Limited's accounts, but it wasn't debt. It was known that it was going to be sorted out. So much of this, in terms of, of, of Sub Postmaster's debt, much of this is about allowing Post Office to see the wood for the trees, for want of a phrase. You know, they're, they're getting rid of all, of, wanting to, to reduce that churn to, to sort those debt that isn't debt out much quicker so that they can actually address the other debt in a timely fashion. The explanation you've just given could be summarised as um, swifter and easier identification Indeed. of debt rather than lowering debt. Uh, this appears to contemplate an actual monetary saving rather than making the thing more visible doesn't it? Uh, but I think post office believed that the two would go hand in hand, that by a addressing these things quicker, they would reduce it. How? Because they could address it more, more swiftly. How? Uh, how? How, how by making it more visible do you lower it? I, well, I presume they believe that there was some that, you know, wasn't their debt, it was someone else's debt. Whose debt? Sometimes postmasters, sometimes clients. So it's actually yep. about sort of squeezing the sub-postmaster. Is that a way of putting it? Uh, I, I think they felt that they weren't addressing things correctly. The sub-postmasters? For, for any of the parties. Post Office Limited felt that, that they weren't managing these things, that things were... Were, were being lost in the system. Can we look at the third um, bullet point, cash management, um, four million pounds annual saving. Um, a four million pounds uh, annual saving in respect of um, cash management. Um, seemingly, would this be right uh, by reducing the amount of cash centre write-offs, is that right? That's right, yes. What does that mean? Uh, again, I believe post office in all of that that um, timeliness, there were were cash was going missing that, that they couldn't account for it where it where it had gone. Um, sub postmaster going missing with the sub postmaster. Sometimes with sub postmasters, some po sometimes with cash centres, sometimes it, with in delivery vans. I don't know. It, it was it was a, a case of trying to tighten up on where all that money was going. And so, out of the I think twenty one million pounds. Um, annually envisaged saving that's mentioned in this paper. The two things that we've looked at account for about 13 and a half million of them, is that right? Uh -huh. Indeed. Can we go over to page eight of the document, please? And look at paragraph 1.2. Uh, Fujitsu Services response. This paper is Fujitsu Services response to the above requirements. The principles embodied in this proposal are, and then if we can just um, look at the, the four at the bottom of the list, 
please. Thank you. Um, the proposed solution minimises costs and risks to post office by adopting optimum service boundaries and an incremental step-by-step -step approach to development which moves the business progressively towards post office IT directors' strategic architecture. Uh, the sequencing of projects is devised to deliver early benefits to support the post office objective of early return to profitability. We are, however, proposing an urgent start to the design work to maintain the proposed schedule. Uh, skip the next one. And then lastly, the proposed commercial arrangements aim to create uh, the simplest possible structure within which change can be managed without undue contractual overheads. And so those three bullet points that I've read, um, would this be fair, are Fujitsu emphasizing a swift turnaround and simplicity in order to maximize value for the post office? That's right, yes. I think we can see this further in page 14 of the document. Under 1.4, uh, after the two bullet points, um, other timetable considerations are covered in section four. And then this, it's important to note that delays will result in release windows being missed and consequently will delay the realization of the identified business benefits. Delays are also likely to cause some of the dependencies within the horizon agreement not being met in time for the scheduled SI commitment fee reduction in spring 2005, such delays would increase the um, future horizon uh, costs. Uh, so again, this is Fujitsu stressing to post office that there are costs associated with delay. Is that right? Um, indeed. Uh, can we turn to what the document says about the new proposed arrangements, including the new financial system, and look at page uh, 22 to start with, please. at the foot of the page under paragraph 2.6. Um, second sentence, the following arrangements are proposed. Uh, new financial system um, to, to be deployed within the manned horizon data center and operated alongside other horizon central systems. The co-location of the systems will allow consolidation of audit archiving and backup facilities and over the page please at services as well as maintaining close proximity of the financial system to its main volume source of data i.e. the transaction management system and then this the integration within expanded horizon enables Fujitsu services to take responsibility for the complete transaction processing activity culminating in the ledger outputs without the need for mid-process reconciliation. In what way did Fujitsu take responsibility for the complete transaction processing activities? Um, as it happens, I don't think they did. I think that was a proposal that wasn't taken up. The, the system that we're talking about was Post Office decided to, that um, Prism Alliance would develop that instead. Um, and so... And why was that? I don't know. I why? Believe there was a, I believe there was a competitive um, tender or, or process to, to choose who would present that. And um, Post Office Limited, as a, as a customer, chose to get Prism Alliance to do it. But the, the proposal was to do it, and that's um, one reason why why Fujitsu at the time felt that's, that, that that would be a good idea. It was a sales pitch. Can we um, go on to look at the projects um, that were proposed and go over the page to page 24? I'm taking this at um, 
at some speed. This is a 109-page document, so I'm uh, going through it. I, I, yeah, indeed. I think it's also important to recognise that the, much of these proposals were sort of um, weren't adopted and, and were taken and changed by Post Office Limited later. And we're going to and come on and look at those. Um, so project one, better overnight um, cash on hand um, uh, data. This is described in um, uh, paragraph um, 3.2.1. And I, I just want to read this to understand what might be the drivers um, for uh, the adoption of this process. Um, it reads, within the cash management function, two fundamental changes have made post offices' funding position a critical business um, uh, survival issue. Um, first, the business is trading at a loss. And second, the migration of benefit payments from order books to ACT will be accompanied by the loss of pre-funding by government departments of the necessary cash in the network. The business will have to borrow funds to fund any trading losses and working capital needed in branches. Such borrowing is limited in availability and its costs reduce profitability. From April 2003, the DTI will provide a loan and will require a robust statement of cash holding as security. So just, is it fair to say that that's uh, what is described there, the business trading as a loss, the move to ACT and the loss of pre-funding and the need to take out loans are an important part of the background to the entirety of this end-to-end -end project. Absolutely. Key. Key. Key drivers. Key drivers. And so, to your knowledge, is this right that um, the post office was trading at a loss at this time? But as I understood it, yeah, that, that's what I was told. And so, was the post office, to your knowledge, motivated principally uh, by a means to ensure cash flow and to reduce losses to the business to um, offset the impact of the removal of benefits agencies' business to ACT? Um, I don't think so. Um, it, it, so, again, having seen some of the discussions um, around the, the early parts of the Horizon um, project and implementation, and I've seen um, some of the, the witness statements of, and that mention some of the reluctance of post office to adopt um, ACT, um, by this stage... The, the conversations I was having with post office seemed to be that they'd um, become resigned to it or uh, uh, embraced it even um, and were seeing that this was opening up other markets as well that um, that that you know, um, in the same time scales um, bank branches were closing through around towns all over the country at the, at the at the rate of knots post office had a uh, a very spread out network and um, people would be able to accept because as well as um benefit recipients being able to withdraw funds from their bank accounts then non-benefit you know <laughs> the waged um other people who could couldn't access bank uh, bank branches could access post offices more easily, so I think they were they were sort of uh, in trying to embrace this, but had other problems at the same time, uh, which reduced the amount of investment that they could make. As a whole, the paper seems to um, have a, a couple of overarching aims. One is to improve cash management. Uh -huh. and two is to reduce debt. Were each of those motivated by a need to plug and to plug quickly? a gap in funding caused by the removal of the benefits agency business caused by the move uh, to ACT? Not that I was informed, but it could have been. I don't know. This is described as a critical business survival issue. Did that accurately? I, as I understood it, I, I think... Um, as, as much as, as all of what you've just said, the things that come out of here to me are the additional costs that post office were going to take on in terms of servicing this loan. 
um, they have a, a very <laughs> um, broad network that uh, involves um, providing lots of cash to lots of branches. And so I think it, uh, there's a mention in here of £350 million pounds of, 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 of a loan to be held. And this is, this is new costs to the post office. Um, so just, just holding that cash on a, you know, in order to, to run their business was going to cost them a lot more. They, they had previously been um, having that cash pre-funded to them and they were going to have to service that. Looking um, at the last sentence, um, uh, in that paragraph from April 2003, the DTI will provide a loan and will require a robust statement of cash holding as security. Um, so to understand exactly what's being said here, the DTI was going to provide a loan to the post office, or loans to the post office. Indeed. In order to provide the loan, the DTI needed to know that the information that was being provided to it, the DTI, by the post office was robust. That's right, yes. Was it not seen as robust at that time? Uh, no, I think uh, post office's um, requirements you know, were clear about that, that there was a lot, you know, all of that debt and the time in debt, that debt that wasn't debt, reduced the robustness of that, of that statement. And um, so, and I can never, I never really got to, 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 to grips with understanding when Prism Alliance had, and, or Post Office's IT department before then had implemented SAP ads. Um, they may have implemented by then, or it was a project at this stage. I can't remember um, the, the details, but before impact, um, the SAPAD system, which had been developed mostly as a as a stock management system and a distribution system for for cash, um, it wasn't a cash management system. If I make that distinction, it wasn't trying to manage the overall holding down of, of of cash down. It was, which would have to happen in order to be able to service this debt, I believe. So, would this be a fair description? At the point of this um, proposal, you understood that the data produced by the Horizon system, together with the post office's back end accounting systems, did not provide a robust statement of post office's cash holdings? Um, well, yes, that's true, but predominantly the, the, the sources that they were looking for for that robust statement of cash holdings was the back-end accounting systems and SAP ads. Can we go over the page, please? And the top of the page, the proposal reads, um, to support the business in managing through this difficult situation, the business requirements detailed below will be addressed uh, by this project. Um, first bullet point, to be able to accurately identify physical cash at the branch rather than overall cash, which can include cash equivalents such as checks. And then the third bullet point, drive down cash holdings and therefore reduce the DTI borrowing requirement, which in turn will reduce the level of um, interest um, paid. Uh, can we look please at um, project three on page 30? It's at the foot of the page under 3.2.3. And this deals with the automatic um, remittance of cash into branches. Uh, can we look at the uh, business requirements being addressed? Last sentence on the page. The particular business requirements being addressed by this project are, and then over the page,
uh, to improve the financial controls for cash remittance, remittances, whether currently losses of £5 million a year, improve management information li linked to financial statements to support the management of cash funds, to enable cash holdings to be driven down and therefore reduce the DTI borrowing requirement, which in turn will reduce the level of interest paid to be able to forecast and manage cash flows within the DTI target. And then um, an explanation of the requirements is given. And at the very foot of the page, It reads, when the barcode on the pouch is scanned, the delivery notification will be found and the content can be used to remit in the content as defined by the cash centre stroke um, stock warehouse. Go over the page. If the postmaster subsequently finds any errors, these can be recorded as discrepancies. Note that the current system allows the postmaster to remit in whatever value he likes, and it's left to some central processing to identify any mismatches between what is remitted in and what was dispatched, forcing the dispatched values to be remitted in and then highlighting any discrepancies should simplify the central process processes. And then under paragraph 3.2.3.1, the... Um, design solution. The document goes on to explain that, and if we look at the bottom um, large bullet point and then three in, the clerk will have the option to check the contents now or later and a separate dialogue will allow him or her to declare any discrepancy between the amount remitted in and the actual content. Any such discrepancy will then be handled as a suspense item until the matter is resolved. Note that the pouch number is used as a link for any such transaction to allow any subsequent error correction um, to be uh, managed. Can you explain, please, what is being described here? Um, yes, it's... Um a proposal which I think, yes, it, it ended up being implemented. It did. Um, probably best if I describe the process before and after, as before and after. Um, before impact, when a, uh, a cash pouch was being delivered from um, a cash centre, then the, there was a, a barcode scan, and that would produce a, a receipt which the postmaster could hand over to the um, deliverer as their receipt for having delivered the cash. But that made no changes to the, the branch accounts. Um, in, in process discussion workshops, um, the scenario was always described as there was a queue of pensioners going outside the post office. Um, at busy times, deliveries would be made, the scan would happen, and the, the pouch would probably be put in the safe to be remitted in later, and um, so postmaster could go back to serving customers. Um, when remitting in later, uh, uh, bear in mind that when it remitted was remitted in, if that happened on a uh, a Wednesday morning, if that delivery happened on a Wednesday morning, then the the remit in might not happen until after the cash account had been produced, so that that cash account wouldn't reflect that delivery. When the remit in happened, um, at whatever time that happened, um, sorry, if, if the cash, um, cash account had been produced at that time, then that would result in a reconciliation discrepancy in post offices, systems, the cash, cash centre had sent this money, it hadn't shown up in the, in the accounts, and would take time to resolve itself through various processes of error notices and things. Um, when the, the um, cash pouch was being remitted in, the postmaster would open up 
the, the pouch and either using the delivery note or, or counting the cash and they would be presented with a form on, on the Horizon system to enter how much in tens, how much in twenties, how much in fives, et cetera, et cetera. And that would then remit that in. But by the nature of this, they would be remitting in what they were reporting and that was um, that could could um, happen that that mistypes happened at that point Typ typographical errors could could come in but of course whatever was being reported would be what the system felt and so the system fig figure for cash holding if the, 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 the figures hadn't been entered correctly the system figure could be incorrect for the actual cash holding. And that might create discrepancies. Also, depending on whether they were checking against the delivery note and the actual contents, then there may well have been an error in packing. Because when people put deliveries together, sometimes they don't put all of what, what was ordered into the into the um, into what into the delivery. And so there were various areas of discrepancies that could occur at various times and because of the weak based processes would take on average three weeks to resolve. What auto remittances was trying to do was say the, the cash pouch um, delivery would be prepared the night before or the, the, the planned delivery would be prepared the night before and passed to Horizon so that an electronic delivery note would be delivered to the Horizon system. When the cash pouch um, barcode was scanned, that amount would be automatically remitted in according to the delivery note. But then later there would be, instead of the remit in process, there would be the verify, I can't remember what the, the, the function was called, but it, the verify a remittance process that allowed the um, post, sub postmaster to, um, to open up the pouch and check its contents and report any discrepancies. And so, so cutting through it, this was intended to um, reduce the possibility of mistakes or fraud by sub postmasters? All, at all of those different opportunities for errors were trying to reduce them. Indeed. Can we look, please, at page 34, which is project four, branch liability management. Um, the goals are identified under um, the bullet points under the text there to simplify the identification of debt, to reduce the amount of reconciliation and increase the amount of debt um, recovered. And the uh, proposal, I think, is set out um, halfway down the page. Um, it's, it's towards the foot of this page. To refocus on debt recovery, financial recovery of money, a target of 95 percent but only 10% of discrepancies are actually debt. And you've explained that to us already, I think. And, and, and that's a restated of post offices' stated requirements and objectives from the feasibility study. And at the foot of the page, it records that branch debt is currently identified within the transaction processing system when the cash accounts are being checked. Generally, this means that it's of the order of two or three weeks after the original debt was incurred before it's spotted and investigated. Um, and the debts believed to be owed here, um, they are debts owed by sub-postmasters, is that right, as well as client debts? Uh, these ones are, are sub-postmasters, yes. So these are just talking about sub-postmaster debts, right, yes. Client debts would be a, 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 a client debts would be identified in the central accounting system, CBDB, as well. So as this is just sub-postmaster debt. And then if we go over the page, please. The Fujitsu document goes on to um, describe the next um, or how the project will 
address discrepancies in stock or cash declaration. Uh, so the next analysis phase of the programme will carry out a complete analysis of what activities at the outlet can result in need for debt recovery. Uh, the following are candidates. Uh, the first bullet point, discrepancies identified during a stock or cash declaration process that the postmaster is not prepared to um, accept. Uh, as part of the declaration process, the postmaster will be given the option of, quote, making up the difference when a discrepancy is spotted, effectively selling him or her the stock if it's a stock discrepancy or topping up the cash in the till in the case of a cash discrepancy. Alternatively, he can refuse to make up the discrepancy and force the discrepancy into a suspense account for later resolution. So at this stage of the process, is this right that Fujitsu envisaged two possible um, processes, forcing the postmaster to pay up or um, uh, refusing to make up the discrepancy and forcing the discrepancy into a suspense account? That's right, yeah. Well, effectively, either accepting that this was a, 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 a discrepancy of the, the branches making, um, giving someone too much change in a, in a transaction, say, or, or disputing it with, with post office by putting it into the suspense. And did you see, or did Fujitsu see, that second alternative, disputing it, as being um, catered for by forcing the discrepancy into a suspense account? Um, Yes, I, I'm, 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 the, the word force there is, a, is, a, is an intriguing word. I'm, I'm not sure what that was trying to say. but um, Why is it intriguing? I, well, because it, um, tr transactions in systems can't really be forced. You know, there's, there's a, you, know you, you choose whether to do one or the other. But yes, it's a, options would be given. Can we move to project five? We'll come back to a lot of this in a moment when we look at the um, removal of the suspense account facility. Uh, can we turn to project um, five, please, on page 40 of the document? Um, the priorities of the project here are to reduce the amount of reconciliation required, put the emphasis on clients and customers to validate data, and enable matching of cash up branches with settlement with the client. Yes? That's right, yes. And then if we go to um, 3.2.5.4, on page 43. Uh, under the heading at the top, resilience requirements, the new harvesting process will ensure that no transactions are lost and any duplicates are eliminated. Can you just explain in general terms what that's referring to? Not sure. Sounds, sounds too technical for me. I, I don't know. OK. Looking at um, taking a step back from um, the document, and that can come down from the screen, thank you. Would you agree that um, some of the uh, additional reconciliation steps that were um, being removed from the process describe the role that was previously played by a post office team at Chesterfield? Um, that's right, yes, yeah. Um, and so impact had the effect of um, essentially automating that part of uh, an accounting process previously conducted um, at Chesterfield, error reconciliation, I'll call it, well, by um, individuals, humans. Indeed, o automating much of it. I'm sure there was still some left after, after um, impact. 
but yes, there, there were when I when I um, first went to to Chesterfield to for some of these initial meetings and, and workshops, um, very very large. Um, open plan offices with huge numbers of people with piles and piles and piles of paper, 17,500 cash accounts. And a, a cash account wasn't just, as we've said, there's all the forms and the um, things that go with a cash account. Uh, um, 17,500 every week arriving in Chesterfield. Um, I, I never really understood what was, what was happening there because I, I, we didn't fully analyse the, the, the back-end systems, they'd already been decided that they needed to be replaced. Um, but there seemed to be an awful lot of data entry happening as well. Um, so I'm, the, the, these physical, physical cash, cash account forms were being sent to, to, to Chesterfield, and data seemed to, even though all the data had previously been sent overnight um, into systems that would be accessible by those individuals, there seemed to be an awful lot of re-entry of, of, of data. I never really worked out what they were trying to, what they were doing with that. One of the reasons for what became the impact programme we've seen included decreasing operational costs by the post office. Indeed. And uh, to your knowledge, does that include reducing the number of staff at Chesterfield previously process, processing transaction corrections and sums held in suspense accounts? Uh, yes. So, were the processes, looking at it globally, introduced by impact, designed in part to shift the burden of and responsibility for the identification and rectification of errors onto sub-postmasters? Um, it, it drove it towards them. I don't think so. I think they already had those responsibilities. The, the identification of those, of those errors were always going to happen in, in the branch when they were performing their, their accounts. Well, to take an example, we've seen how the rectification of errors in pouches remmed in uh -huh. would be um, by the sub-postmaster having to raise an error for um, reconciliation or correction. So it's placing the responsibility onto the sub-postmaster, isn't it? Uh, indeed, just, just as whenever one receives a, a, a delivery it's your responsibility to check it. But would the effect of this um, process mean that it was very important that the manner in which sub-postmasters could um, raise errors with the post office and then how those errors would be addressed was going to be particularly important for the accuracy of the data that was produced by Horizon? I agree, yes. What steps were taken by Fujitsu and the post office to ensure that any debt recovery against sub-postmasters was limited to what could properly be described as true debt? Um, I think we've just jumped a long way. We've been looking at, at yes. your proposals. And, uh, but um, I think, well, so, for example, in areas like remittances, um, as I understood stood it, most of post offices, um, if not all of post offices, cash centres had invested in CCTV over, over the, the packers, and pickers and packers function, so they'd, they'd know, be able to, to when, when errors were reported, they'd be able to verify those things. Um, in terms of um, other other areas, like burglaries, fires, whatever, um, Horizon getting its sums wrong, then you rely on people identifying what went wrong where and how much it was was impacted. Relying on the sub postmaster to identify it. Uh, ultimately, yes. And. Would this be right, that the safeguard that was introduced was that the sub-postmaster would have to agree a discrepancy and any subsequent transaction correction? Um, they'd, yes, they'd have to agree that, but have to agree they had the option to not agree. 
And what happened if they didn't agree? Well, it would be further investigated, further disputed. By who? Like any res by people in Chesterfield, as I understood it. Did the system allow for um, a dispute to be raised? Um, well, so by posting into suspense, effectively, yes, although that, as I understood it, wasn't the, the method by of raising a dispute. That the, the, the suspense account was um, the way you accounted for sums that were in dispute, not, so uh, um, you had to, the, the sub-postmasters would have to raise, uh, raise a call to NBSC to get permission to enter amounts into suspense. And um, that was the raising of the dispute and the uh, entering things into suspense was the way of accounting for amounts in dispute. It's my understanding of post offices processes. We'll come back to that in a, in a moment later on. Uh, also dealt with in this document, although rather briefly, is the subject of um, the subjects of data integrity and in financial integrity. If we can look at page 87, please. Um, if we just look at um, 86 first, I'm sorry. Under 7.6 service boundaries, the service boundary is designed to enable Fujitsu to take responsibility for the integrity of complete business process outputs. And then over the page, under the uh, just after the bullet points, uh, the integrity of the financial and cash information is achieved by applying best practice perpetual inventory and double bookkeeping methods, and by ensuring that the transactions always flow from the counter to the financial system without manual intervention or service. Um, boundary. Does that um, description mean, in essence, that the integrity of the accounting information relied on the automated processes of Horizon themselves being infallible? Um, no, the, 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 um, the flows being talked about here are from Horizon to a new financial system. And, and a, a full um, chart of accounts from the, the, um, the transactions in Horizon all the way up through to post offices' corporate ledger. And that's what that's trying to, trying to explain and describe. But it um, depends on the... Um infallibility of the data being produced by Horizon, doesn't it? Uh, correctness, yes. And in order for such infallibility, i.e. genuine integrity, it was essential that Horizon contained no bugs, errors or defects that produced um, uh, false data. Um, well, I think realistically there was always going to be bugs, errors and um, defects. So this is this is trying to say that it's reducing key and errors, reducing other other influences on the correctness. If um, primary responsibility was being passed to sub postmasters to spot errors and challenge discrepancies, whose responsibility was it to identify and investigate bugs, errors and defects in Horizon as root causes of the discrepancies? That's a, a shared responsibility between post office, what the sub-postmasters or NBSC, um, identifying those and 
um, Fujitsu investigating them and resolving them. I, I've looked at the 109 pages of this document carefully, and I can't see any mention of that in here. Um, uh, well, I, so I, I guess it was taken as a as a as a given because all of this is within the context of the of the Horizon contract. Was the reliability of Horizon taken as a given? Um, probably yes. At the time that you were um, reading, contributing, approving this document, had anyone drawn to your attention? Uh, a slew of issues that had arisen with the integrity of the data that Horizon was producing in its um, model office testing, its end-to-end um, -end testing in the acceptance phase of Horizon and in the course of its rollout? Uh, no. Did you work on the basis that the data produced by Horizon was therefore reliable? Um, yes, I, it was being used on a daily basis. Post office weren't telling me that it had problems. If it did have, I presumed that it, they had been resolved by now. But was anyone in Fujitsu telling you that this was um, a project that wasn't free from difficulty? Um, I don't think so. Uh, can we look, please, um, at where the document deals with um, data errors, just under where we're looking at. Data errors caused by system mismatches should be eliminated by enforcing consistent end-of-day cutoff and reversal rules. D did that assertion that data errors would be eliminated itself rely on Horizon functioning reliably? Um, I'm sorry, that I, don't, I, I don't know this. This sounds like a, a, a technical um, don't know. Um, the document continues reconciliation of online transactions as between Transaction logs and client stroke agent system will identify transactions which broke or were cancelled after NWB authorization. NWB authorization? NWB, I think, is network banking. Uh, for um, example. Authorization presumably is, is getting the message back from the bank that the um, that that it's okay for the for the for the transaction to proce proceed. Um, but but sometimes the, the, um, the system can request funds from the bank, the bank can authorise it, but if the system doesn't then get back to the bank to say we've now taken it, then the bank don't process the transaction, but the system at this end might think that it has successfully performed the transaction. Those, that's, I think, what's being talked about by Broke there. But okay, And then skipping a paragraph... Post office personnel may inspect transactions which are found to have been subject to EPOS keying errors where the value of the transaction is not captured automatically by the system from a token and post messages to postmasters to correct um, such errors. Uh, post office personnel may inspect transactions subject to bad debts, e.g. bounce checks, and post messages to uh, postmasters to either recover or write off these debts. Alternatively, these messages could be generated automatically according to floor limits. Trend analysis by branch could be considered as an additional aid to exception management. The need for reconciliation between TPS and OPTIP is rendered redundant and is eliminated. Again, did the system um, rely on the automated reconciliation working effectively and identifying where a discrepancy had arisen? Sorry, could you repeat that question? Yes. Did the system that's described there uh -huh. rely on the automated reconciliation process working effectively and itself identifying where a discrepancy had arisen? Uh, it did. The, the, the whole system relies on an end-to-end -end reconciliation, yes. 
and then it required on um, if a, di a discrepancy arose for the sub postmaster to challenge the discrepancy. Um, although this identifies so, um, so it, uh, the, the, the paragraph um, three from the bottom post office personnel may inspect transactions which are found to have been subject to EPOS keying errors. So presumably, where value of transit not captured automatically, that, that paragraph is given an example of where errors might be spotted by um, post office limited personnel, people in Chesterfield. So that's, um, I don't know, things like um, uh, paying, paying a, a, a utility bill of £40 and the clerk has typed in, um, has hit the, the double zero button twice and ended up um, keying a, a transaction of £4,000 but not spotted that it's gone through and accepted £40 in cash and that's created discrepancies. You told us already that you worked on the basis that Horizon was operating reliably at this date because nobody had told you otherwise. Do you know on what basis the post office and Fujitsu were satisfied that Horizon was operating in a way which was so f sufficiently robust to introduce these further automated measures, reducing the um, number of personnel at Chesterfield and placing the responsibility on sub-postmasters? I, I don't think I, I, I knew that. I Was there any discussion that you were a party to or you heard about the reliability and robustness of Horizon at this date, early 2003? No. It just simply wasn't a topic of conversation? I, I, no. I think... I think you know, it, it was known that there were, there were, you know, like any other system, it would have its faults, but... And nothing more than nothing, that? Nothing more than that, no. So that's um, an appropriate moment, if it suits you, for um, the morning break. Yes, of course. What time shall we resume? Um, can we say a quarter two, please, sir? Yeah, by all means. See you then. Thank you very much. So good morning. Can you uh, see and hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can we pick up with page 71 of the document that we were previously looking at, please? And this sets out a series of assumptions that Fujitsu made, principally um, concerned with um, pricing. But I just want to look up um, what some of them are. Um, if we look at the foot of the page, please. Um, it, it has been assumed that the existing links between Horizon and post office data centers have sufficient capacity to accommodate the access requirements to the extended Horizon estate. And then over the page, please. Um, two bullet points. Um, sorry, four bullet points in. It's been assumed the end-to-end -end projects are implemented without any requirement for branch site visits by Horizon engineers. And then two bullet points from the bottom. It's assumed that arrangements relating to post office access to audit records are as detailed in the existing agreement. The, the suggestion that... Um, an assumption was made that the solution can be produced without the need for upgrading the correspondence servers or the data network. Does it follow that no assessment or analysis of the underlying Horizon network and its uh, reliability had been undertaken by Fujitsu before the impact program? Um. I'm sorry, I, I don't know whether that had happened. I think that um, is talking about links between um, Horizon and replacing links between Horizon and um, TIP or OPTIP, as it was known, 
and replacing it with the new financial system, so rather than any significant changes in the Horizon um, branch to data centre network. That, that set of links is talking about. So putting the document to one side then, to your knowledge, was any analysis or um, assessment made of the reliability three years into operation of the Horizon network uh, before the changes that were proposed to be made by the impact program would take effect? I don't think so now. I, not that I know of. Can we turn to page, um, on this page, five, sorry, six bullet points from the bottom. No increase in support for litigation investigations has been assumed. And then the bullet point that I have just read, it's assumed that arrangements relating to post office access to audit records are as detailed in the existing agreement. Uh, can you help us um, what consideration there was of the level of litigation investigation support that was being provided already by hmm. Fujitsu to the post office? Uh, no, I don't know. Don't think, don't think I was involved in, in assessing that. Does the inclusion of these bullet points suggest that um, uh, Fujitsu um, and those working on impact, including you, must have been aware of the role of Horizon in the potential liabilities of sub-postmasters and therefore the role in Fujitsu in supporting litigation by poll? I, th I think that was known and what these assumptions are saying is that that won't change. What did you know about the role of Fujitsu in the provision of evidence or data in litigation by the post office against sub-postmasters? Then, um, I think I knew that, that um, um, Fujitsu could be asked to provide um, evidence of, of a, a transaction streams and accounts and I think that was probably it at the time that I knew of. Given that knowledge, what steps were taken to your knowledge by Fujitsu or the post office to consider how the automation of the process of reconciliation might impact on <coughs> potential civil and criminal liabilities of sub-postmasters? Um, I don't know. You're not aware of that having been considered? I, I, I don't know whether it was or wasn't. We're introducing a more automated process of reconciliation. Indeed. That, has, that may have consequences for the civil or criminal liability of sub-postmasters. Yeah, as I understood it. <laughs> uh, what, what steps must we, Fujitsu and Post Office, take to ensure that people are not um, investigated, audited, or prosecuted on a false prospectus? I, and I don't know. I, I wasn't involved in that aspect of this solution. Did you know that sub-postmasters were being prosecuted at this time on the basis of data produced by Horizon? I don't think I did. Was the use of data by Horizon in criminal or civil litigation against sub-postmasters discussed ever, to your knowledge, as part of the impact programme? Uh, explicitly as part of the impact programme, no, I don't think it was. Um, I think, you know, I knew that those reports were being produced for such purposes, but I didn't know what was then done with them. Were you aware at the very least that sub-postmasters had a contractual liability to make good shortfalls shown by the Horizon system? Um, yes, that, that was um, discussed. I'm sure we'll come on to um, the, the 
the changes that were made. Uh, where did you get that knowledge from? Um, from post office representatives. What did they tell you about the contract? Sorry, which which contract? The, the, the sub between Post Office Limited and, and Sub Postmasters. Yeah. As as to the liability to make good shortfalls. Um, so, as I understood it, um, ultimately, in order to um, operate a post post, post office branch, um, post office gave the, the sub postmaster uh, an, an amount of money and an amount of stock and had to account for that, was liable for accounting for that um, through the transactions and by producing a, a, um, a, a balance sheet, which in practice was a cash account. And what were you told as to um, the liability, or the contractual liability of the postmaster to make good shortfalls? Uh, that, that they had that contractual liability. Any, any shortfalls? Any, uh, any shortfalls for which they were at fault? Any shortfalls so, which, um, for which they, uh, negligence could be shown? Any shortfalls for which fraud could be shown? Any shortfalls where the system showed a shortfall, irrespective um, of the cause of the shortfall? So <laughs> many of those... If the, if, the, if the system could be shown to be doing it, no. Sorry, if the system if could the, be... If the system could be shown to be having got its sums wrong, if the system was getting th those sums wrong, but, but you know, those, those had to be identified, investigated, verified. Did you understand that to be written into the contracts for sub I, I didn't ever see a contract, and I didn't know whether, whether the details of the contract. It was just a, a statement that... You know, shortfall. So, um, if if a clerk were to um, to tender incorrect change, give out change for a twenty pound note when only a ten pound note had been tendered, that would be a, a discrepancy of, of ten pound that the, the sub postmaster would be responsible for making good. Yes, I, I'm exploring what your I, knowledge no, was of the. Um, extent of the liability to make good shortfalls. Was I, it to that obvious example, or was it any shortfall shown by the Horizon system? Uh, I think it was most... My understanding was it was the obvious examples, the, the things that were... And who did you get that understanding from? Um, from the post, post office representatives that were telling me about how... I, I'd never run a post office. I'd never worked in a post office. I had to rely on their, their um, information. Can we turn, please, to poll um, 303 Now, you tell us in your witness statement, it's paragraph 13, we no need to turn it up, that although the substantive delivery of the project may have been undertaken by the PRISM Alliance, your team was responsible for the conceptual designs which underpinned the project. Is that right? Um, no, ultimately, post office were responsible for the conceptual... The conceptual designs were um, design docu uh, requirements documents. Design proposals were, are, are still um, design documents in response to those requirements. So this is a, re a requirements document and this is a requirements document is it this conceptual design is post office's business design for specifying their requirements it's written by you I, i'm named as an author i think because i um pro i i helped dave parnell put together the um there's lots of, of business process models in there and documentation behind the business process models and so i had experience of of extracting the, the business process diagrams out of the tooling that we'd used as part of this process and, um, and, the, and the documentation behind those in those models. And so I assisted in, um, in 
author in this document, but editorial control was Dave Parnell's and was post offices. So, so really where it post says requirement. authors, you and Dave Parnell, that, that's not entirely correct? I, I'd say Dave Parnell, this was Dave Parnell's document. I helped him with some of the, 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 edit, you know, the, the, the typing. Um, this, um, could, at, he, at one stage, um, couldn't he type? <laughs> um, Nineteen years ago, um, uh, collaboration systems weren't as advanced as they are today, and in practice, typing things into documents would involve one author at a time editing. So he would send me the, the document, give me the control of the document to type, uh, edit in, add in the um, things like that I added in, the, the um, process diagrams that he'd asked me to edit, put in. Um, I think I might also have edited some of this in terms of um, Fujitsu feedback, because we had feedback from a number of reviewers in Fujitsu who, you know, were asking elaboration questions. Can you explain what this means? Why, why, what, what are we trying to get at here? And so I'd done those. And I think at one stage, I must have had control like that of, of, edit, of typing it into the document. And because um, I think I've seen some um, in the pack here, some um, minutes to documents saying, you know, Dave Parnell to, to verify this. Phil Boardman to type it into the document. OK. Um, can we look, please, um, at pages uh, 13 to 14, bearing in mind what you said as to your role in uh, this document? So page 13, please. Um, this sets out the business proposition, and then under 3.1.1.2, which is about halfway down the page, the key priorities um, are set out, and these echo uh, some of the issues that we have seen in the document that we looked at before the break. Um, make the identification of debt um, uh, easier, um, increase the amount of debt recovered, and put the emphasis on clients and customer, customers to validate the data. And clients and customers there, that's including sub-postmasters? Um, I, I, yes, I think it will be. So it's putting the emphasis on, amongst others, sub-postmasters to validate data. Yes? Yeah, indeed. That was a key priority. And then under 3.1.1.3, business drivers, we can see again a repetition of some of the things we saw in the earlier document. Uh, refocus on debt recovery, uh, financial recovery of money, a target of 95%. Only 10% of discrepancies are actually debt. Establish a debt, uh, central debt monitoring environment to enable the identification of debt with a high degree of accuracy. Accounting and settlement on our data, not clients manual journal documents and human intervention produce errors. Settlement estimating can produce positive or negative interest situation. Would you agree overall that the uh, principal justifications for change were the recovery of debt and the shifting of responsibility in respect of reconciliation? Um, yes, yeah. Uh, um, I think... It Somewhere in this document, this, this section explains that it's a, a, effectively a restating of the, the a section from the end-to-end -end requirements feasibility document. And so the document we were looking at earlier and this have derived from the same source. The inquiry's heard um, evidence of um, a number of bugs, errors and defects which arose during the um, development, testing, and rollout of Horizon. To take an example, the inquiries heard evidence that there was um, a document produced called the EPOS Task Force Report, which recommended that the whole of the EPOS system be uh, rewritten. 
were you and your team made aware of documents such as that? Uh, the first I heard of that was was through the listening, some, seeing some of the evidence from, at this inquiry. Was that information which um, you think ought to have informed the work you were now undertaking in 2003? Um, I don't know. I, um, I don't know whether it would have changed anything. Ultimately, I was helping post office with their requirements. You don't think it would have changed anything? I, I don't know. Can you think about it? <laughs> and help us. So we've he heard, if you've been following, as it seems to be the case, the inquiry quite carefully. Uh, no, no I, I watched some, some um, witness evidence sessions because I was preparing. I've, I've now um, prepared to come to the inquiry three times because the, the inquiry postponed twice. So each time I've watched some more. I've ended up watching a lot more than I ex ever, ever intended to, and I just wanted to prepare myself. Um, but, so I've seen th some of the e evidence, but I haven't really been following it. Do you know that the inquiry has heard evidence of the existence of a series of um, recurrent um, bugs, errors, and defects in the testing rollout and acceptance phase of Horizon that led to data integrity errors? Uh, now, yes. Do you think that's information that you should have been aware of when assisting with the typing of a document like this? No, like I say, I, I don't know whether it... I, I think, I presume that other people that were involved that knew about that because I hadn't been involved before 2002, but other people had been around and they would have known about those sorts of things and would have presumably um, Piped up. Come, to, come, well, and come to the conclusion that those issues had been resolved by that stage, but I don't know whether I'd have... Um, Who are the people that you've got in mind that had that continuity of knowledge? Um, well, people in post office who probably were involved. Who and, have you got in mind? Uh, well, the Dave Parnell, um, Sue Hardin, Clive Reed, who was um, IT director at the time, and people in, in Fujitsu, like Gareth Jenkins, like Tony Drahota. What did you know about Gareth Jenkins' involvement in the um, development, um, acceptance and rollout phase of Horizon? My, my understanding was that Gareth had been around for a long time and was very knowledgeable. Can we turn to page 14 of the, um, the document, please? And turn um, to paragraph 3.2.1. Um, underneath the diagram, there's a helpful overview of the um, system that is proposed. And if we can just go on, so, so it says the specification of the requirement detailed in this document, including the descriptions of the new branch trading processes where relevant and practical have taken the following principles into account. And then if we go over the page, please, to page 15, and look at paragraph 11. <coughs> Uh, within the monthly trading period, branches should have facilities to identify and the flexibility to manage local variances between system-generated and actual cash holding positions in line with principle one above. These variances will be identified through one of three mechanisms, um, and then four mechanisms are set out. Uh, a cash declaration, a stamp declaration, a stock check or declaration, or balancing the SU, the stock unit. Stock unit. Yes. All local variances identified at the branch must be actioned within the monthly trading period, i.e. stock units should not be allowed to roll over at trading period end with an outstanding local variance. Prior to balancing the stock unit at period end, any outstanding variances should be forwarded to the branch manager stroke supervisor stock unit as local suspense items that should be addressed locally at branch level before the branch rolls over 
into the next trading period. And then at 12, by the end of a monthly trading period, branches should be required to make good discrepancies between horizon-generated cash and stock positions and the actual physical position determined by branch office staff. To help facilitate this, existing horizon facilities that permit branch staff to post cash discrepancies to a cash suspense account will be removed. Remaining branch suspense accounts should only be used following prior authorization via post office central processes and will re be restricted to use by branch staff with horizon manager stroke supervisor roles. The, the document goes on to explain that suspense um, sums could be cleared in several ways, including um, uh, to cash or by transaction or by a sub-postmaster paying from their salary or from a credit card. And that by contrast, in directly managed branch, branches, um, supervisors would be able to clear values into a central write-off. What provision was made here for sub-postmasters to challenge a discrepancy as having been caused by a horizon error? Um, I think two. Um, um, facilities there so in, in, at the time of initially identifying the discrepancy and um, can we go back up to the top of 12 there yes um, so this idea of by the en end of the monthly trading period um, in practice I believe the weekly cash account cycle meant that very little investigations of, of accounts where they, where they were, what was happening, um, whether they were correct, was happening within the week. And so this idea of by the end of the monthly period, branch should be required to make good, but, it, oh, sorry, actually, go to the top of 11, <laughs> misremembered. But within the monthly trading period, branches should have facilities to identify and, flexibli and the flexibility to manage local variances. So the idea was here that instead of always being found at the point of rollover of the cash account or the trading period uh, as it would be, that variances would probably be identified more often between, between times. So um, as part of another change, there was um, a, a nightly p um, process of um, the ONCH process of, de of, of uh, declaring a, a total amount of cash held in the branch, which had been in instigated purely to feed SAPAD's data so that it could do its its um, planning. Um, but then this was changed to a, a cash declaration which would compare the amount um, entered against the system-generated figure and tell you on a nightly basis if that was operated um, that what you'd identify variances within the month rather than only at the end of the month. Um, the other expectation, I don't think it, it's really sort of brought out in here, but during the conversations, I think post office were anticipating giving um, advice and guidance that um, post offices would use balance periods between trading periods more than they had done previously with balance periods and ca cash account periods. Uh, have, have people explained the difference between balance periods and cash account periods to yes. Mr. Scipioni so you understand that? So, um, but the expectation was that the, the, the branch wouldn't go the whole month without doing a balance, but they'd only roll over balance periods, so they'd maybe do weekly or fortnightly balance periods. And so it was much more to try and find, make it much more likely that those uh, discrepancies would be discovered within the month rather than at the end of the month. When they were discovered... Well, so, so far, all of the things you've described are processes put in pay, place that might make it... Um, might make the identification of a discrepancy more timely. Indeed. And so... What happened... Once they were, once they were identified, yep. then the options were to dispute that with NBSC and put it into suspense or um, and if having done that 
the transaction corrected. Sorry, can we scroll down again? <laughs> We're just on the on the edge of a page. Um, the the transaction correction option there, if it had been raised into suspense and raised as a transaction correction, if post office had investigated and decided or felt that that this should be pushed back from suspense back to the, the, the postmaster, they had an option within the transaction correction processing um, dialogues to, to dispute that again. The, um, you said if post office investigated, and then you corrected yourself too, if post office felt. Well, having investigated, if they felt that they needed to, that the transaction correction was to bring the, the, um, the sum back from suspense onto the postmaster's liability. If, if, post, the if the transaction correction were taking the suspense and writing it off, I think it would be unlikely that the, that the sub postmaster would um, would challenge that. Would complain. Yeah. But they but but they might. Um, but transaction corrections could be challenged. Where's the description of that in here? Um, I'm not sure it's there. You see in paragraph twelve. I think that was that was elaborated further in the in the later um, discussions. You see in paragraph twelve. Yeah. It's in the second sentence. It says to help facilitate this existing horizon facilities that permit branch staff to post discrepancies, post cash discrepancies to a cash suspense account will be removed, but then remaining branch suspense accounts should only be used, etc. Yeah, there's some, some really confused <laughs> writing in here. Um, so so what, what th that appears to be, uh, in the one hand, saying so that a suspense account facility is going to be removed, but then the remaining suspense account facilities have to go through a process managed by managers and supervisors. Can you so, so I, explain what that is attempting so to I, describe? I think, I think the first element of, of trying to explain this is that the term branch staff here is used to be two different things. Um, in the first instance, I think it's meaning anyone who worked in a branch, anyone who had, had a, a, a user, username and login into the system. And in the second, sorry, Same word the second you. it's using that. In the first, it's it, it was it's trying to say those that aren't managers and supervisors. That way around, isn't I it? I see. So, so it it's a narrowing of the facility of posting discrepancies to a suspense right, so account rather than the removal so of a suspense account for something. That's the first element of reading that and correcting its, its, its language. The second bit is um, the cash discrepancies thing here, and posting cash discrepancies to cash suspense account. And so when um, posting, the, the phrase post or transfer to um, discrepancies to, to suspense, is is used, but when performing that, what's actually happened is is a, a, a transaction. Everything in Horizon is performed as a transaction, and so what's actually happening is that a transaction is happening to is is being created that um, takes liability out of the the um, branch accounts and puts it into the suspense account. There were a number of of um, suspense products that could do those things that were seen as generic um, products. I think we'll, we might see a document later where it talks about loss A to table 2A, loss B to table 2A, loss C to table 2A. It, sorry to cut through you. It's a short point that the use of the word cash discrepancies is to narrow a description of the species it, it, of discrepancies. Indeed, because ultimately all discrepancies were cash. Everything, the, the cash account was accounting for cash. Everything was turned into cash whenever... So if, you, if, if stock was, was lost, 
removed, as we discussed earlier, then it would be turned into cash to be accounted for. So all discrepancies were cash discrepancies. I think this is talking about a very specific set of cash discrepancies. And so was the primary safeguard that this system adopted against sub-postmasters being saddled with debt for which they were not responsible, that they were required to agree debt or post it to a suspense account? Yeah. Yes. Without doing either of those things, though, they weren't allowed to continue to trade in the next trading period, were they? Um, yes, they were. And, and um, this is something you, <laughs> I, I heard you say in the, um, in the um, opening statements to phase two. And I You're think, going to correct me. I think that's incorrect. Um, so if you didn't roll over, so in, in terms of the, the, these, these um, checks, you couldn't roll over without balancing the, the last stock unit, or you, and you couldn't roll over the branch without balancing the last stock unit and ultimately come into a balance. Um, but the, the net effect of not rolling over wasn't to stop you trading. The net effect was that on the day after not rolling over, into, an, into a period when the calendar said you should have rolled over, you'd get a warning that you should have rolled over yesterday, which you could accept and carry on using Horizon. So you could just carry on indeed. and just accept these warnings indeed. for, for uh, months, months and uh, years? Uh, uh, well, <laughs> indeed not. So What would happen if you just ignored these warnings? So um, messages um, uh, were created when uh, rollovers happened yeah. and when they and not when they didn't happen, and post office would monitor that and... And do what? And go and send retail line MBSC to talk to the post, so postmaster, to as do I what? understood it, to, to ask them why they hadn't rolled over. And let them carry on trading? Well, no, because... Um, what would they do then? Well, sorry, I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's something you'd need to ask post office how they'd get someone to do this. There were technical limitations that... Um, that the horizon counter had that meant that it um, could only I think I think it ended up being at 45 days so it could only store retain data for 45 days that the, the um, we saw earlier that it was assumed that that no branch visits would be necessary no engineering would you know that they wouldn't have to so no one would have to go out and and install a larger hard disk into the into the counter um, PCs so um, I think, as part of these discussions, the, the, the trading period, um, the, the length of the trading period, was set for the 445 um, calendar as it was, and it was agreed that the data retention would be 45 days. And so post office would need to start doing, take actions pretty soon after a cash account didn't roll to try to make sure that we didn't get into the situation where data in the branch had been lost. So you're, um, you followed the phase two opening carefully. That was one of the things that you, I, I, you looked, did you? I, you looked. Um, I downloaded the transcript and searched for impact because I thought it would be um, pertinent to what I was going to be talking about. And your evidence is that a sub-postmaster is in fact not prevented from trading if they... Um, uh, don't either accept a debt or put it in a suspense account. And pay, sorry, pay off the they, debt. They, they wouldn't be able to roll over the last stock unit, and they wouldn't be able to roll over the um, trading period. And so what effect would that have on them? But, like I say, they'd get a warning the next day when they logged on. And what, they can just ignore that warning, can they? Well, no, because post office would manage that situation. Hmm. But, but, like I say, you'd need to talk to post office to how they'd manage that and what they'd, they'd do, but there's a... It's an investigation. Can we turn to page 18 of the document, please? And look at 4.2 under the heading um, legal and regulatory. Um, the document states, um, it will be verified that branch processes and reporting changes meet legal and regulatory financial reporting constraints, e.g. auditors, to ensure that there is sufficient information from the new system to
to support mm -hmm. regulatory reporting, litigation, and criminal prosecution. What steps were taken by Fujitsu and, to your knowledge, the post office at this stage to consider how data produced by Horizon was capable of supporting these legal and regulatory obligations? Um, I don't think any particular work was done by Fujitsu. You can see the, 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 the second column in that table. Uh, allocates it to Pol. Allocates it to Post Office Limited. So, um, so, and um, I remember there being long conversations around this. Um, between who and who? Um, between post office mostly, like I say, we were, we were in the room listening to them talking rather than actually being actively involved. Uh, um, names, please. Um, sorry, can't remember. But um, at the can, start... Can you, can you try a bit harder? Well, I... I if, yeah, if, if you wouldn't mind. I, I guess um, the retail line ops, I think, was Ruth Hollerin. And so there was a key sort of... Um, stakeholder there but you know some of this um, a lot of the the um, hoped for we talked about the huge amount of paperwork going backwards and forwards to Chesterfield and so there was this um, requirement to try to um, truncate the the um, the branch trading statement as it as it became no longer having 17,500 cash account forms arriving in Chesterfield every week. Um, at the start of this morning's session, you asked me to look at a particular page of this, this thing, and you said, is that my signature? And I said, yes, and you were happy to accept that, that um, response. But you and I know that that isn't actually my signature. It's a, um, it's a, a printout of a digital image of my signature that we separately and via the Fujitsu Council have agreed to accept as my signature because that's the way the world's moved on since now, since then. But back in 2002, three periods, post office were getting 17 and a half signed forms, actual signatures, not- Incidentally, pulling you up on that, I accepted it was your signature because you told me so, having, I, well, having, having well, affirmed. And, and, it, it, and it is, is a representation of my signature, but like, Rene Begreet's painting of a pipe. It's not a pipe. It's, it's not. I didn't sign this piece of paper. I didn't ask point that. No, no, I know. But that's the point I'm trying to make is that this is that post office were receiving 17,500 signed cash account forms in Chesterfield every week. And, and as a result of this, they weren't going to be receiving those, and they needed to try to work out whether they needed what 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 evidence of of um, the sub postmaster accounting for their their branch liability was likely to be sufficient. You said um, a moment ago that you remember a lot of conversations around this. Uh, um, yeah, because the the. What were the conversations about? But, well, the, ultimately about about the 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 text that would have to be on a screen that would then get accepted. Something about a true a true reflection of of um, trading and remaining liability or whatever it was. I can't remember the the, the text. A text on whose screen? On, on the horizon screen that would be presented to the sub postmaster that 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 would then um, they would confirm that this was their branch trading statement and that they were happy to roll over this looks to be looking at a different issue namely the production by the system of data to support litigation and criminal prosecutions so not a sub post, not not um, a screen that a sub postmaster signs off, but branch processes and reporting changes that will support 
um, civil litigation and criminal prosecutions. Were there discussions about those issues? Uh, no. I'm sorry? No. So you're referring to discussions about what the SPM screen looked how, like how, when they were certifying something? How confirmation of a, of a set of accounts would, would happen. Can we look at that, please, at page 69, please, of the same document? at the foot of the page under discrepancy management. And so this um, section um, of the design proposal um, concerns circumstances where an error has been identified in a transaction, correction is generated, correct? Sorry, sorry, I can't, I'm not, I'm not working out which bit of the, the page are we looking at. So we're looking at 10.1.4, discrepancy management. Right. And we're in the arena of an error has been identified and a transaction correction is generated. Indeed. Yes? Yes. And if we go over um, the page to page 70, please, and look at 10.1.4.2, handling of transaction corrections. Um, the automation described, there will be a button for transaction correction management within the menu hierarchy, which is only accessible by users with the appropriate role. This will provide the user with a list of the unprocessed transaction corrections displayed in date and time order. Having selected the transaction correction to process, the system will display text making clear what will happen when they select any of the options presented. For each transaction correction, the user will have up to three options. Each option, when selected, will perform an identified set of transactions defined within the transaction correction, which may include an option to do nothing, oh. at requesting further um, investigation. So, so when you asked earlier where is this <laughs> specified in this document, it's there about transaction correction. Effectively, that's requesting further investigation. And so was this button um, uh, put into effect, the third button? Um, um, uh, do nothing, I request further investigation? I believe so. And on what basis do you believe so? Because um, it says so there. I, I, I don't know what was fully implemented into the system. The inquiries heard evidence that was in there was in fact no means oh. to roll over until transaction corrections had been processed and the sub postmaster was required either to make good or accept the shortfall. And that there wasn't right. um, a third option of do nothing, I request further investigation. I, I don't know why that didn't happen. Can you help the inquiry as to um, any discussions that you were a party to as to why that option um, wasn't implemented? I, I really don't know. I don't think I, I have, can't recall anyth any, anything of discussing that not happening. Whose responsibility would it be to carry that into effect? Um, it would be between the, the architects, designers and, and post office, except in the design. Just look at the table underneath 10.1.4.2. Do you see um, in that next box there will be a button, etc.? Yes. And that seems to be allocated in that second column to Fujitsu services, doesn't it? Yeah, so, so that would be implemented in, in the system. That was the requirement was to re implement that into the system. You uh, can't help us as to if, it, if it's right that that was not implemented, uh, why that wasn't so? I, no, I really don't know. Can I turn to the issue of the removal of the suspense account? Uh, can we look, please, at um, FUJ 
2012-6032, sorry, 6036. Can we look um, at page three of this um, email chain, please? I should just look at page four to see who this email is signed off by. But this one's Clive Reed. Yeah, right. I just want it to be on the record so we sure. can see it. You, you may know the documents inside out. Um, I, no, no, they, but, this, um, I, I, I've, I've I, just got to make I, sure. I, have, that it's I hadn't seen this until uh, for 19 years until last week, <laughs> but I, yes, I've read it. No. Um, so it's signed off by Clive Reed, the chief systems architect um, within um, Post Office. And if we go back to page three, please. Um, This email, I'm not going to go to the previous page, it is addressed to uh, Ruth Holleram. What did you understand her job to be? I, I believe she was director of the, uh, the retail line branch network. Um, uh, Tony Marsh, what did you understand his job to be? I, I think he responds to this, so I think he worked for Ruth. And um, copied to Sue Harding, what did you understand her Sue was job program to be? manager for the impact program. Um, and if you look at the email, um, Mr. Reed says, we're currently in the middle of requirements workshops on the final phase of the impact program. Although we have a scheduled stakeholder meeting early in February, given the tight timescales, there's some emerging concerns, which I think I need um, to flag up. And then the first of them under uh, suspend account threshold, um, essentially saying that the, um, well, you can read what it says, the current assumed position is a single threshold of £250 will be applied by Horizon, below which uh, variances cannot be placed into suspense account. This is a new system control which does not currently exist. Can you recall what this was about, what the idea of the introduction <laughs> of a floor of £250 was? I, I never really fully understood this, but um, this is a, a post office seemed to, to have this idea that they would give um, a threshold that anything under £250 would be at the postmaster's li sub postmaster's liability and would be um, anything above that would be, um, could go into the suspense account for disputes, discussions, investigation um, so this idea of the single threshold and the um, and the different different ones for different because they talk here about different branch types rather than or office types rather than um, the different suspense products so they appear to be treating all suspense products as the same thing and so again I don't fully understand how you wouldn't be able to raise a, a, a dispute about a discrepancy of the cash pouch was £50 short. If, you know, investigations showed that the packer had not p picked that <laughs> pack of, uh, those packs of 50 pence pieces or whatever it is that came up to 50 pence, £50, pounds, then clearly that would be a, a reasonable um, dispute to, to hold. So, um, but th this is, this is um, eventually... When in the email trail, I, I get We're going to work back. No, no, I know, but I'm just going to say, I'm, I get copied on this, but I think this is effectively internal discussions with post office that we'd expect them to resolve between them to, to decide. But both of these things, it's also important to say, are things that post office had complete control of, that this threshold would be specified if it was to be implemented by post office reference data. That the product uh, that a product can have minimum maximum you know any any product that 
could be traded in Horizon that um, that you could specify amounts of, of the transaction for, it was possible to specify minimum maximum so that, and that, the, that would be used, say, in the utility bill example that we've, I've used before, to, to, to try to um, stop the miskeying. So you might say, uh, back then, paying a thousand pounds on a, on a gas bill was very unusual. Nowadays, it might be more reasonable, but um, but you might say set a maximum of a thousand pounds, and any key-ins of, of you know a large transaction like that would probably be typographical error, to hitting the double zero key uh, too many times. Cut, cutting but, the but, but but this this sorry, I'm just going to say, but that is something that post office had to decide. Yep. So this what is an internal discussion in within post office of whether there should be a single threshold of 250 pounds or a variable threshold. Or a variable threshold. Sorry. Uh, Don't waste time. Yeah, we're being reminded to go one at a time. I apologise. Yeah. The second thing in the list, suspense account authorisation. The current assumed position is that subject to the threshold control above, the requirement to seek telephone authorization for posting variances to suspense would cease on the understanding that improved timeliness and visibility of office liabilities, next day single view of cash, of office cash and liability would provide sufficient control given that currently there's a two week lag between suspense postings and visibility of these centrally. The operations and security view was that removal of this control would declare open season on the use of suspense postings, leading to loss of financial control, spiralling non-conformity, etc. Yes? And, and so... And he raises his concerns. That while we can discuss and take a view on these issues in isolation, my preference is to assume that we can define new back office controls which fully leverage the timeliness, accuracy and completeness of the new systems and therefore challenge any understandable reluctance to give up controls that are already in place. Danger is if we spend significant amounts of time and money while not bringing about the fundamental changes of the program uh, was given the mandate for. I think it's an important position to take in our approach to underline our objective to simplify and leverage new capability but recognise the challenges, therefore, to define a fit-for-purpose control framework which tackles these fears um, head-on. And so is this a discussion within post office which essentially involves the author um, recognising an operations and security view that pushes back against a greater use of a suspense account? Um. Indeed, it, it would appear so. Um, I think the other element of this, the, the, this way forward area, is really talking about uh, um, the the feeling that the impact program would um, would take a, an approach of of um, empowering. You used the phrase earlier of of making responsible for, but. You can also look at it from the positive spin point of view of empowering postmasters to manage their businesses for themselves and um, and only get involved in um, or post office only needing to be involved in this when you know disputes were raised and at this point this appears to be possibly proposing that what I said earlier about uh, disputes that that the suspense account wasn't the, me the mechanism of raising a dispute, it was the way of accounting for a dispute that you had raised. Um, this appears to be potentially proposing that a dispute could be raised by the posting of, of an amount to the suspense account. And because the, because um, post office had um, capable new financial systems, they would know about that within 24 hours and they would be able to do something about it. Anyway, let's look at the response yeah. from um, uh, Mr. Marsh um, on page two. Let me just go up to the top. Thank you. Um, so this is an email from 
um, Mr. Marsh back to Mr. Reid. And then in the second paragraph, he says, on the suspend account issue, I'm afraid I share the same beliefs as mine and other ops reps. If there is no independent control and authorization process for the use of suspense accounts, then postings will rapidly increase to unacceptable um, uh, levels. Irrespective of our aspirations for a simplified process to support commercially minded agents, I believe that many of those of a more historic mindset will exploit the facility. That, that's referring to sub-postmasters of uh, uh, an historic mindset, isn't it? I believe that that's yeah. who we would be talking about there, yes. They'll exploit the facility, creating a large parcel of manual work for somebody, someone, MBSC or retail line, uh, to do, to agree terms, to reduce each individual um, posting. And, and sorry, can I just make a comment about that then? And so what I said earlier about this, this, um, this approach that is being um, suggested in the in the first email about a, a, a sort of um, empowered management approach of managing the retail line. In in this, it appears to be a much more sort of a command and control approach being proposed. In his third paragraph, um, he says, given the overall that the overall project should simplify reconciliation and settlement significantly. Uh, and should therefore mean that errors will be identified more rapidly and will be even more clearly the fault and responsibility of the agent. Is there any reason to have a suspense facility at all? This might mean that in extreme cases, the agent would need to contact the retail line or MBSC and negotiate a loan at some level of interest to cover very high values of loss. But in most cases, the agent should be sufficiently capitalised to cover ordinary vari variations. Y do you understand that to mean, in most cases, the agent should be sufficiently capitalized? That in most cases, a sub-postmaster should have sufficient money in his or her pocket? To accept the liability, yeah. indeed. Seem to be what that's saying. Um, particularly if the opportunity were offered to make good losses via credit card. So that's the sub-postmaster borrowing money on their credit card to make good a loss. Indeed. Uh, thereby enabling them to tap into up to 56 days of interest-free credit. And then he says, a facility favoured by the NFSP, despite my early misgivings. In the meetings and workshops that you attended, can you assist as to whether the NFSP was involved in any discussions or negotiations as to impact? I, I, people mention them every now and again, and um, in, in particular from, from this area of the business, the retail line, but I don't think I ever met anyone from the Federation. So far as you can recall, in the workshops and meetings that you attended, was anyone from the Federation um, I don't present? So. I can't recall that. But what this appears to suggest is the Federation suggesting that its members or some of them should have a credit card, uh, should use their credit cards to borrow uh, 56 days of interest free credit in order to make up uh, losses. Indeed. And um, I don't think I ever found out fully whether um, this Tony Marsh, by the way, sorry, <laughs> whoever it was that the author of this. Um, was intending for this um, su sufficient capitalization to cover whilst a dispute was resolved or just f full stop <laughs> sufficiently cap capitalized to cover it I, I don't think I ever found that out this this sort of conversation happened um, not in my presence in my knowledge but what this is mooting is the getting rid of the suspense account entirely the SPMs are to bear the responsibility for, vari uh, for any variances or discrepancies. Why do we need a suspense account at and, all? They can use their credit cards after and all. And like I say, I think earlier, next in the, in, the, in, the, in the chain, I'm trying to wonder what the implications are for, for um, requirements and whether, like I say, is this uh, whilst, whilst the dispute, so if, um, 
in the other side of the sub-postmasters business, uh, most sub-postmasters being franchisees and most of them running other businesses in their um, convenience store or whatever, if, um, if a, a, um, a delivery had arrived short of um, you know, some, some quantity of things that had been delivered but that they'd already paid for because being a small single outlet business they wouldn't necessarily have good payment terms, then they would be liable for the shortfall of, of the, the non-delivered stock until they'd raised the dispute with the, the, with the um, provider. And so I think this was trying to suggest this, but, but then I'm not sure whether it was, like I say, just full stop, they should be liable for it or whether they should be liable for it until the discrepancy was resolved. And whether what he's also then um, proposing is that transaction corrections, that some sort of dispute resolution, dispute raising and resolution process would then be able to do a transaction correction to resolve those things. But like I say, I, I don't know where this was going. Would you agree but, that um, this appears to be um, proposed on the assumption that the system produced um, accurate data and was infallible and therefore discrepancies must be the result of the sub-postmaster? Um, uh, like I say, I, I don't know <laughs> what the intention of, of this was, whether it was to make them liable full stop or to make them liable until the, dis the dispute had been investigated and resolved. But, you know, um, but there is a, um, a proposal here, like, like we say, to fully um, remove the suspense account facility. That seems to be based on the assumption either that the data that Horizon is producing must be accurate, or even if it's not accurate, we don't care, it should be the responsibility of the sub-postmaster to make good the loss, if you're removing the suspense account. Like I say, I, I don't know where, where this was going. I didn't. Can we look? Um, the email was um, uh, forwarded on page... Um, let's just go to the top of that page first. Uh, Clive Reed forwards the email. If you just go a bit further up the page, please. Thank you. To Dave Parnell. We go to the top of the, um, or the bottom of the next page. You can see it's forwarded to Dave Parnell, copy to Sue Harding. And then Dave Parnell sends it to you for info when we probably need to discuss. And then... I forward it to Bob Gurney, don't I? You forward it to Bob Gurney. What role did Bob Gurney perform? Um, he was my manager by this stage. And you add Gareth Jenkins into the chain. Indeed, because it, it appeared to be a big change in requirements. Or could be. I, di I you know, didn't know what... Um, what the, what the, the consequences of this might be. And then at the, um, if we keep going up... Um, Bob replies to you, Phil, shouldn't get it reported as an in, sorry, shouldn't it get reported as an interim response to the first part of Action 56? So the workshop would then decide how it needs to be reflected in the process models, principles, etc. We will need to follow up with Clive to adjudicate if there is any difference of opinion expressed by Ruth. We also need to encourage Dave to chase people up so that we can get the actions closed down. Can you help what happened next? Um, as I understood it, there was a, a series of meetings next and, um, and I still don't know whether um, when Clive Marsh said remove the suspense account, what he really meant was remove some of those suspense account products with the um, more 
generic names, loss A to table 2A, loss B to table 2A, etc. I don't know what those were used for, but they appeared, they, they were ones that post office eventually decided to remove. Um, so I don't know whether when he said remove the suspense account, he meant particular suspense account products that he felt might be being used generally, or whether he meant fully remove the suspense account and the outcome was some sort of compromise situation of removing some of the suspense account product and leaving others. But Did you work it, with the post office subsequently to ensure that the view expressed by Mr Marsh that the suspense account should be removed, which was the means by the facility by which sub postmasters might previously challenge discrepancies, was carried into effect? Um, I, I don't recall doing any of that. I don't think so. Can you recall whether um, you were informed of any further National Federation consultation or participation in the process about what should happen to um, the removal of the suspense account suggestion? Um, no, I don't think so. Can you recall any participation, other participation, other than through the Federation of some postmasters in relation to this proposed change? Um, no, I wouldn't have, wouldn't have been involved in that at all, but, but I, I don't think I heard anything about it either. Can we go please to um, FUJ 6032? Sorry, FUJ 0012 FUJ. Oh, good. So we were previously looking at an email exchange. Um, that ended on the 23rd of January 2004. And we're now looking at um, what appears to be an invitation to a meeting sent on the 12th of February 2004, the meeting being on the 18th of February 2004. Can you see all of that detail? Uh, yes. So the sent time and date, second line, the subject matter in the fourth line. It's an invitation to a meeting about branch trading, the treatment of suspense at uh, one o'clock mm -hmm. um, on the 18th of February. And we can see that um, the invitees were Anne Clark, Ben Gildersleeve, Clive Reed, Gareth Jenkins, um, Philip Gordon, you, yes? And um, co it's copied to um, Dave Parnell and Julie Pope. Yes. And you see that it says two issues to be considered. Was this effectively a, a rough agenda for the meeting? I, I believe so, yes. Um, two issues to be considered. Daily cash declaration. The issue is whether to keep the daily cash declaration as now or discontinue it. And then the part that I'm interested in, suspense account manual authorization process. Previous discussions on if to keep the manual authorization for process for branches wanting to carry items in suspense and whether to have one universal limit of something like £250 for items in suspense. Uh, the decision was reached yesterday by key senior stakeholders um, to remove the suspense account altogether. This would force branches to make good all losses immediately. This needs to be considered in terms of how branches can adjust figures, hardship cases, how branches will be corrected with errors, etc. So this is an email sent on the 12th of February, and it says that a decision was reached yesterday by Kenya key senior stakeholders to remove the suspense account um, altogether. 
were you present at the meeting the previous day, if there was a meeting, at which senior stakeholders decided to remove the suspense account altogether? No. But do you know who the key senior stakeholders were? I, I don't think I do, no. I don't think it was. I, and, and this is an inv invitation to a meeting that happened on the 18th, yes. I believe, yes. Yes. But, 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 so by, but, are we going to go on to talk about what happened at the meeting at the 18th? No, at the moment, I'm fine asking I, I, you I whether... Wasn't, I wasn't involved, no, I don't know anything about Do you know who was involved? Who I, the, I would the, assume the, the people in, the, in, the, in that email chain earlier, but I don't know. So amongst... Clive Reid, Hollerin, etc. Ben Gildersleeve, Gareth Jenkins, Clive Reid, Phil Godden. Dave Parnell, possibly Julie only, Pope. Sorry, can we go back up? I, I, yeah, yeah. But, amongst that set, I think possibly only Clive Reid. I think it would have been, you know, the the other people in the in sorry in the previous email trail that we'd looked at in the previous document, the the um, Clive Reid, Ruth Hollerins, Tony Marshes, those people would have been involved in making that decision. Were this you is, told is, when you got to the meeting on the 18th um, why the decision had been taken to remove the suspense account altogether? I, I'm, so my recollection of this, um, I think by the 18th, the, the, that removal of the suspense account was elaborated to removal of some products. And so by that stage, it wasn't removal of the suspense account. It was a, a reference data change that would be made by post office. And who explained that to you? Sorry, can't remember. But one of one of the post office representatives on that list, or one or more. Thank you, sir. That possibly um, Chris Allen at that stage. Sorry. Thank you, thank you. That, sir. That's an appropriate moment to um, uh, to take a break if it uh, is convenient for you. Yes, of course. Yes. Um, so we'll start again at 2 o'clock, yeah? Uh, yes, please. Thank you, sir. All right. See you all then. Thank you.